you and will smoothly slide into the panel that will look deeper into these numbers. Adam Kostjal, please join me. You're, you're the head of, of listings uh, for yes. Nasdaq in Stockholm. Yes. Please take a seat. Um, a head of listings, what does a head of listings do? Uh, I'm in Berlin to, uh, to listen to this conference. No, uh, I, uh, I, I basically run, we own and operate seven exchanges in the Nordics. Stockholm is our largest exchange, the most active one, uh, where we have a growth market called Nasdaq First North, which is similar to Deutsche Börse Select Market, uh, and, uh, and also our main market. So I run that business uh, in terms of all the companies that come to the exchange and are listed with us, and also U.S. companies that, or European companies listing in the U.S. So, oh. so that's my focus, uh, and basically helping them, uh, managing that business, uh, on an ongoing basis. All right, welcome to the panel. Thank you. And my next guest, uh, let's see, I have John Hargelid. Please join me. John, you're the Chief Operating Officer of Snowprint Studios. And um, I, I especially wanted you to join this panel because you also own a studio here in Berlin. So you're Stockholm based. You're That's still right. privately owned, right? Uh, yes. But you have been part of um, making a, a, a listing once. Yes, that's correct. So before Snowprint, I spent uh, seven years at Paradox Interactive as part of the management team. So that was quite an exciting journey. And what's the, uh, if you want to describe uh, Snowprint, the elevator pitch? <laughs> <laughs> the elevator pitch, um, we're a small studio based in Stockholm and Berlin. Uh, focusing on tactical turn-based battle games on mobile and uh, trying to, to corner and own that genre of the market. All right, welcome. And I have Florian Sands. Yes, Florian, you're, um, you're the art director for, for Toadman Berlin. And uh, this is kind of um, the flip to, um, to Jan because you're, <laughs> you're a German. You're a German national working for a Swede. Uh, so, oh, you're an Austrian. Yeah, not even. I'm glad we sorted that out. <laughs> so let's, let's go to the Austrian embassy after this. Uh, oops. Yeah, that's my little feedback. I want to be like Jimi Hendrix. So, so um, uh, and you're working for a Swedish company here in Berlin. So yes. we have two sort of Swedish, Ger you see this? Swedish-German connection, different perspectives. So Toadman, the elevator pitch for Toadman. Toadman's been around for uh, just about eight years now and the Berlin studio for four years. Uh, we have studios in uh, Russia, in uh, Sweden, and now here. The uh, mother company is called EG7 that has been like, funded, in the last, uh, founded in the last few years and Toadman has seen quite a very interesting growth, I think. And uh, I've been with the Berlin studio I think just about like three and a half years now. So very much from the start. Mm -hmm. And your mother company is a publicly traded company. Exactly. On Adam's exchange. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's not only your exchange. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe one day. Uh, welcome, Florian. And last but not least, Mr. Remko Wesseman uh, of um, MGI, Media Games Invest. We are more uh, familiar with you in connection with Gamigo. Can you please uh, explain the... Oh, they are so polite. I love it. It's like uh, Skavlan or Letterman or something. Everybody's shaking hands. Maybe there should be a band here next time. Uh, explain to us Gamigo and MGI and the difference there, if you don't mind. Yeah, we are maybe a bit the counter example of a German company coming to Sweden. Um, it started with Gamigo, um, which we acquired in end of 2012 and have been growing Gamigo uh, via buy and build um, and then wanted to go public and choose a shell company, which is based in Malta, to make it even more complex. <laughs> and with that shell company, we listed actually in Germany on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And um, that's probably going to be one of the topics here. We're not totally happy with the German investors and uh, then decided to do also a secondary listing in uh, Sweden, uh, where Adam was very helpful with his team. And since then, uh, the company looks also totally different. Uh, we have much easier access to capital and have been f even faster growing since. So it's a bit of an, uh, let's say, 
German company as a start. Uh, majority of our revenues is now in the US actually. And we run several studios, uh, although we don't do new development of games. So what we do is um, publishing games that other studios have developed or acquiring companies with existing IPs that we then build and uh, further elaborate. So we have 100 game developers in the company, uh, but they work mostly on DLCs for our MMOs uh, to further develop those. All right, welcome to the panel. Thank All right, you. so you see here now I have um, a German games company listed in Stockholm and in Germany. I have uh, a German, an Austrian German uh, <laughs> working for a Swedish publicly traded company. I have a, a Swedish company owning a studio in Berlin, and he used to have a background listing a company. Can you think of any more combinations of Sweden and Germany? I think I covered all the bases. And then I have two sort of uh, a bird's eye view experts to, uh, to give the context. So I cannot dream of a better panel, no pressure. Um, let's try to figure this out. How come Sweden, the small part, the small country in the faraway corner of Europe, can be the biggest investor uh, in in the German games industry? Uh, I, I come back to you, Remko. Uh, you, you you almost started explaining that, but can you please elaborate? Why did you choose Stockholm for your dual listing? What what was it with Stockholm that was useful for you? Maybe the easiest to describe, if you talk to a Swedish or Scandinavian investor uh, and try to describe your gaming company, they ask you about what's your difference, um, what kind of games do you run, uh, how do you uh, differentiate from still front Embracer, uh, EG7. And when you talk to a German investor, you need to explain what gaming is. And, um, and then basically you get all kind of prejudices like, yes, my daughter doesn't like their kids to get her kids to game and gaming is maybe not so good and these kind of things. So the, the education of the investor landscape is totally different. And that has partly to do, I would say, with uh, early stage um, looking for a cluster. I mean, was, uh, yeah, the Nestec, I would say, that really has actively been uh, approaching game companies uh, to get listed. And by having a cluster, I mean, having one company listed is difficult. We were the only game company in Germany listed, or still are, I think. And uh, it's much more difficult if you have a peer group, um, you get investors there. And I would say in the beginning, uh, nothing went wrong also because all the game companies, the valuations only went up, everything was perfect. Uh, there have been now some cracks in it. So there's also, uh, let's say investors at the moment also in Sweden are correcting their portfolios a bit because also some of the game companies didn't perform as good anymore. It has to do with COVID, with other things. Uh, but still, it, it's a much more educated, um, investor circle that you're talking to, which makes things a lot easier. Mm. So, uh, Adam, Remco says you actively reached out to games companies. Yes. Why, why, why would you do that? Well, I think uh, overall, uh, um, I mean, if we trace back, I mean, everybody, I think, remembers the listing of King in the US, which was perceived as not a great success uh, because they didn't live up to expectations. And I think the issue here is, they are a fantastic company, still are, uh, but the challenge with being a listed company on the, on the exchange as a gaming company is you can't be a one-trick pony. Uh, so you, you need to be a diversified company being able to show that your growth is coming from many different sources. And uh, if you have that model in itself where you are diversified and you have many different legs to stand on, I'm not saying King did not, but it was so evident that Candy Crush was the big, uh, the, the ship that, you know, the, or the main engine. Uh, if you have that business model where you can stand on many different legs, the exchange is ready to embrace you. And, and the reason why they're ready to embrace you is because they feel that this is, you know, the, it, it, I think we talked about this, the Swedish economy is very digital. It's, it understands the potential of the growth uh, dynamic behind gaming industry. Uh, we already had a very strong cluster outside the exchange, and it was natural that it started gravitating towards the exchange. And I think the reason why it gravitated towards the exchange is because many of these companies were looking for a platform for growth. And a platform for growth, in that sense, is giving them access to the share to acquire other companies. Uh, creating liquidity uh, for employees to become a more attractive uh, employer. Uh, and, you know, from an overall visibility point of view, it, it created a dynamic where, th where they were much more visible uh, as a company overall. A and I think that has led to the fact that 
Many other companies have grown through acquisitions. I think many other companies listed on the exchange have also had an easier time to attract talent or have a new tool to attract talent, which I think is key to competition and succeeding in the long run. And, and I think once you had, you know, one Frederick Wester, I remember so well, Lars uh, Wingefors saying when he listed, rang the bell uh, for Embracer. Uh, it was, at the time it was an Embracer, uh, but uh, he said, if Frederick can, I can as well. And obviously he's proven him right. But, uh, uh, and you know, of course, and what the investors love is someone that delivers quarter on quarter. Uh, and so when Lars and Frederick and many others, uh, or Remco, come to the market and say, listen, I've delivered on the quarters, I've delivered on the KPIs that I promised you, I'm looking for more growth capital, it's relatively easy to push that button to raise that capital. Uh, and as a listed company, you don't only have to raise equity, you can also raise debt much more easily. So you're really creating a, a broader platform. Of course, it's visibility, and visibility comes with a price. If, if you don't live up to the expectations, then you're punished. Uh, but if you do live up to the expectations, then you have much more depth in terms of being able to grow your business. But that counts for each stock market. And if I look at the huge difference and between not, listing in and Germany not and in Sweden? That's not unique for Sweden. No, uh, And you're absolutely right, Remco. And I think, to just add to that point, which I would be curious here, this is, I think there's a differentiation. Oh, it's so, you know, that's the, visi that's the downside of being listed, that you're visible. But overall, the sector will not benefit from the downturn in a yeah. sector. So overall, being on the exchange gives you more leverage anyways. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I interrupted Ranko. Yeah, sorry. yeah. I, I felt that you were on to something more. No, no, there. I just wanted to make that remark that, let's say, um, Germany also has a stock exchange. It's actually much larger than the, than the Swedish stock exchange. But the difference is really that the cluster idea. And I think you started yeah. actually with iGaming as the first cluster, if I'm correct? Yes, uh, absolutely. iGaming as in betting was uh, one of the sectors where we oh. started targeting internationally. Then ESG came yeah. uh, and closed that sector for, uh, and also a lot of regulation. But that was already after you started gaming, because otherwise yes. gaming might have not been a success. That it, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And in parallel to that, gaming, and we have biotech, we have clean tech now, and so on. But overall, uh, we are trying to position this market as an alternative for the German market. And the reason why we feel the German market is a captive audience for us is that there are extremely well-run businesses. Uh, there are some fantastic entrepreneurs. Uh, they run their business not only commercially well, but also with good governance. Uh, and, but there's no fundamental capital market to support them uh, when it comes to a public market. Uh, and they only have to depend on private capital. And depending on private capital is very narrow. Uh, and, and therefore, we feel that the uh, Stockholm Exchange could be an alternative for German growth companies in different sectors, especially gaming. Mm -hmm. So that's the discussion we had with Remco, uh, and, and Remco was brave. He's an entrepreneur, so he took Thanks. on. He took it on. Yeah, can uh, you can you tell us how it happened? Did you take him to a nice dinner and a movie? No, no. I mean, <laughs> <Full> treatment. <Yeah. laughs> no, I think everybody. I think everybody knows about Embracer, Steelfront, uh, and many others. And I remember on game, I, I sat in a panel with them at Bits and Pretzels in Munich. And I told them jokingly, hey, guys, you should look at the Stockholm Stock Exchange. And they called me, and I showed them around. And they were looking for a buyer. But uh, all the banks were basically saying to them, we can IPO your business. And they were shocked, uh, because no one had told them that in, the, in Germany. Uh, and uh, they were almost the same valuation as Stillfront at the time when they merged, even potentially a bit higher valuated. Uh, and they merged with Stillfront. Uh, so that's another great example. Uh, and I think Remco saw all this activity that was going on and the power that many of these Swedish companies had and contacted us and then we continued the dialogue in terms of who he should be talking to, who, you know, but Remco did the job. We, we just uh, helped. Well, we first work. tiptoed in the water with a bond. So we had yes. a Swedish listed bond already before we listed there. And then um, we wanted to go do a listing in Sweden uh, much earlier than we actually did. And we did a round with investors, which is not very known here. Um, and um, then the investor said, yeah, you're like a still front. And still front had a very low valuation then, which was actually lower than our valuation in Germany. So that was the reason that we didn't list at that time okay. and basically postponed it with almost a year. And, um, and now afterwards, uh, yeah, I mean, really happy because uh, the share price went up. Uh, you have much more 
capital available, you can M&A a little bit faster and, and uh, grow. That's great. great so story. come come to us for the inside story on how listings happen. Uh, Adam, you talked about w all the benefits of, of German companies. Jon, when you opened your office here in, in Berlin from, from, from Snowprint, how did that happen? What was it that made you, you know, choose Berlin of all places? I mean, not that there's anything wrong with Berlin. I love it. <laughs> no, I, I, I've lived here myself uh, for a while. So um, um, I, think, I think there's two parts. One is a bit more uh, an opportunity arose. Uh, we had friends working uh, at uh, another company here in Berlin called Vuga, who decided to do a shift in their strategy, uh, which meant that there was a, a group of people who didn't really fe feel at home anymore. And we happened to know one of them very well and said, hmm, maybe this is an opportunity to just uh, really expand faster than we uh, had originally planned. Um, and we also, the, the second part is more strategic, where we saw that at some point the, uh, the competition for, for people and talent in Stockholm is just going to get very crowded for us. And Berlin is a much bigger, uh, bigger pool of great talent to keep growing. Um, so it, it was just a, a way of becoming twice the size really, really quickly and then have a talent pool that was, I think it's four or five times uh, uh, what we would have in, in Stockholm only. Opportunity and strategy, but you say you were friends. Uh, yes. So, you, I mean, you, 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 you do a cookout from time to time and you enjoy each other's company, but they must be talented game developers as well. Oh, what was obviously. The, and had you, had you made friends in the industry or how did this happen? Uh, that, that's a very long story, but uh -huh. I would say that the, the games industry in general, is, it's like one big happy family most of the time. Uh, that's what I was hoping you yeah. would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would say it's, it's very, very easy to network. It's very, very easy to just shake hands with someone you never met before and, and hear their story and then continue the conversation if you, you have something in common where you can help. And if you, if you don't have that now, you'll have it five years down the road when things have grown, changed or otherwise. Mm. Because Berlin also has a lot of cold winters, I guess. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, true. And uh, you might think that we are in the business of games, but we're actually in the business of love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what was the biggest obstacle opening shop here? Um, I, I should be completely transparent that I wasn't personally with Snowprint when we did open shop. Uh, that was Wilhelm, the, the Berlin studio manager down here. Um, but as I understand it, it's the paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork uh, here and there. You need to go to different authorities and agencies and have a lot of help involved uh, to make that happen. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much just to buy a computer and get going. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, John. So uh, coming to you, Florian, you... you um you were part of, of the opposite end of, of such a process. Uh, tell us, how did it happen when Toadman uh, opened here and, and how did you come, become involved? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I can echo a lot of, of <laughs> what you just said because I think that's kind of the story of how businesses start here. Um, I, I would, when I started here, about, I came here to study game design. That's why, what drove me to Berlin. And I worked in uh, indie games for a while and then uh, found uh, Todman just setting up a uh, shop here, basically. And I think Berlin has, I can really only speak for, for Berlin, that's been like my experience in Germany with game design in general, but Berlin is a great attractor. Um, when you come to Berlin, you have the, um, the advantage that you can scout internationally because people want to be here. Of course, the pandemic has hampered that quite a bit, but, um, in our studio in Berlin, uh, of the 20 people that we are here, only three are German. Mm. And uh, I'm just the Austrian sneaker agent <laughs> going in. But it's, uh, we get not only access to a talent pool that is from Germany, we get access to a talent pool that is uh, very European and then international. And um, I, I want to add to that also that I think currently the 
the industry and the many of the big players, because you mentioned Vuga, they're massive and they're also in Berlin. But many of the big players are in mobile and um, many of the, much of the industry here is uh, in free to play, mobile browser games, this kind of, um, that kind of segment. Not to say that there aren't any console and PC developers, uh, but it means that for Toadman, it was a log logical step to come here because if you have a, a city that attracts highly educated people uh, you, and you get into a segment of the market that isn't very, uh, like there isn't a lot of, uh, let's, let's, because you pointed that out uh, too, I hear s scouting for talent in Stockholm is horrible. I hear it's really hard. There's so many big players there that if you want to be like mid to uh, absolute AA plus or even like going to triple A um, spheres, you suddenly have to compete with uh, DICE. You have to compete with like, there's a lot of big players. These aren't as established yet in Berlin. I think that will happen. But it's a great uh, win, a, in a, there's a great spot of opportunity right now, I think, for the German market. And I think that is why Toadman decided to set up shop in Berlin. That's a really interesting observation. If you look at a lot of other big cities around the world, uh, at least where there are successful games industries, there are all the international players are present. In Stockholm, that's the case for sure. Here, not so much. So it's definitely happening. Yes, yeah. it's becoming more, but it's not as yeah competitive. All right, let's uh, take it from Toadman. You can you can reap the talent here <laughs> and make great business. Um, Johanna, you talked about um, how uh, uh, the, the, the growth has also been acquired growth. And I think there, there's a clue to some of the points that Ada made about how um, uh, the publicly traded companies can use their shares to uh, acquire overseas. What, how has that trend been in your, in your research with acquisitions overseas by, by Swedish companies, particularly on the stock exchange? Um, yes, that trend definitely exists. I think one of the, the one of the, I've, I've been working or I've been working writing the report. I think it's for the last uh, four years. I, d I didn't do it last year because then I was on maternity leave. But uh, so four years ago, we, we we could just start seeing the acquisitions, and we actually. We did a special report on just acquisitions and investments uh, for for the industry to and and started to to map all the investment that was made in in the Swedish market as well to to get a clearer picture of it because at least um, like when um, uh, politicians or b officials. Um, have been asking about um, investments in the industry, you, you usually get the picture of like, oh, it's all these big American companies coming up and buying, buying up all, the, all of the Swedish studios. And uh, for a while, that was the case in a way. We have uh, DICE, that's uh, an EA studio from, I think it's, uh, is it 10 or 15 years they've been owned by EA? 15 years. Uh, we have uh, Ubisoft as a, a big studio in Sweden with, with Massive. Uh, King was acquired by Activision and, and Mo Young was, was acquired by, by Microsoft. But what has happened after that is that the Swedish companies really catched up and uh, they, they were starting to, to building uh, their own empires <laughs> in a way. And, and we have some, some companies like Stillfront has done that for, for really a long time and, and been working with, with uh, M&As for, for, um, fr from the start basically while uh, Embracer with uh, Vingefors has come from from maybe a different angle with uh, uh, publishing and IP rights and then moved into uh, to look into more game development. And, and so that's b that business have, has grown for a while. So uh, you can really see the shift. And, and I think uh, a lot of more companies are, are looking into that. And I think, um, I think Embracer was, was the most and they had like the, the largest market value in, in, in Europe. I'm not I'm not sure if they still 
if they still do, company. but yeah, as a gaming company, yeah, I, yeah, think, I think, so. think they had for a while, yeah. Yeah, and I actually I think they still does. That's or it's I, it's I think it's Embracer with Ubisoft and it's CD Projekt yeah, Red. Yeah. They they are competing about around the throne, and and I think it's it's like amazing that this Calsta company has that, and 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 the fact that they're not alone as well with EG7 and. Um, and still front and G5 and, and Thunderful. All Thunderful, yeah, Thunderful mm. is st starting as well. And mm. and we and have paradox. and mm. we have also not to not forget to mention, but um, uh, Mag uh, Interactive and Paradox and and those companies are more like looking into their own development and and, and broad broadening their um, their own studios with a way. But mm. yes, it's a trend. Good. So, uh, Remco, is it fair to say that you've also successfully used this strategy of, of M&A with the stock exchange as, um, as the source of capital? Yes, we did already M&A before. Yes. So we started basically our M&A in 2013 and we did the listing in 2020. So we have done few year, uh, let's say quite a few years without the oh, uh, right. support. But uh, life changes. Uh, you can buy larger targets, you can buy more profitable targets. Before we were Let's say we have been buying a lot of distressed companies uh, that we restructured, uh, which is more tedious, more it takes more time to, to get it. And now with access to capital, it's easier to buy profitable companies. On the other hand, because there's a lot of companies having access to capital, uh, you've also seen that valuations of certain game companies are going up. So acquisition has, in certain categories, not become cheaper. But there is a market consolidation going on. Uh, it makes sense uh, for a game company to be larger because you're just more efficient. Um, also, uh, if you do game launches, you need to be able to run a portfolio strategy because not every game launch will be a success. Uh, for that, you also need a certain size. Uh, so as such, it really makes sense to, to grow, um, either organically or inorganically or both. Um, and the stock market, um, how do you say it, um, um, enables that or ma makes you grow faster enables you to grow faster. Mm -hmm. Adam, uh, so we had a different couple of different perspectives on, on using shares for acquiring other companies. Do, would you say that the games industry is particularly ap interested, has a sp special appetite for this, or do you see the same in, in other parts? Well, I, I think um, there's two ways to, or two or, or three ways of raising capital on the exchange. And, and I think a lot of people are focused on the IPO, but it's really an ongoing dialogue with the market. And if you, um, if you are able to you know, get the investors on board, you get their commitment to not only raise capital for the IPO, but on an ongoing basis. So, and there's two ways of doing that. You can easily do it th through debt. Uh, and of course, being a listed company, it's easier to do that because you have a lot of transparency in place and the processes in place. And, uh, and, and then, of course, you can raise new capital uh, equity. And I think there's a very efficient tool of uh, uh, process to do this in Sweden where you can direct that towards certain investors. And so I think that it's quite complex to do that here in Germany. So the point I'm trying to make, it's not only on the, about the day of the IPO, it's ongoing basis. And I think when Remco goes back to the market and, and continues to deliver it on his strategy, both organic and through acquisition, investors are looking to put uh, equity uh, or capital into action uh, and, uh, and to look for a return. And, and if they believe in what Remco has done and, uh, and continues to deliver on that, he has gained the trust of the market and it's easy to raise capital or, or easier. Uh, and uh, and that's <coughs> what we've seen with Lars, uh, with Embracer, uh, and Lars, you know, throughout the years, what he's done, he started with the local market, now he's got the Canadian pension fund on board, you know, uh, he did a capital raise last year, I think it was roughly 650 million euros, you know, so substantial amount of money on an ongoing basis to grow his business, to fuel that growth, but again, if you don't deliver, uh, that trust is gone, uh, and uh, so. But if you do deliver, it's it's a very efficient market. And and uh, when it comes to debt, because Remco did an interesting one, and then we've seen a few other German companies do that. First, do a bond on our market, build a relationship with some of the pension funds there or the institutional investors. Uh, uh, and also put the processes in place because you have to communicate with the market. We also have Hertha Berlin actually, who's listed with their bond on, on the, the Nasdaq Stockholm market. So it's not only gaming companies. What, but the, the football club? Yeah, yeah exactly. Wow. So, but 
I think in, in summary, the, the reason why the Swedish market is so strong is A, we have great entrepreneurs, of course, but you have that in Germany as well. <laughs> Two, you have 80% of the population owning shares. So what I usually tell German companies when we're at mm -hmm. Gamescom is that you see these as users of your game, but in Sweden they're also potential investors. Uh, and, and that's quite a large amount of investors. Uh, and uh, so, so that's one aspect. It's not only about the retail market, it's really about the institutional market. And here in Germany, the institutional market really doesn't get active until they are able to deploy a certain amount of money. Uh, whilst in Sweden, they're willing to put smaller bets, but it's still pension fund, it's still institutional money, which is professional in dealing with capital investments over time. So we are seeing small, you know, institutional funds mm -hmm. deploying smaller amounts of capital to support smaller growth stories. And they get rewarded because if we, we tend to look at Embracer now at the valuation there now, but when they were listed, they were 3 billion euros, uh, 3 billion Swedish, uh, which is 300 million euros in valuation. Uh, and they, they were backed by institutional money. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's really what distinguishes our market because here in Germany, we have the same rules, we have the same underlying market, but it's just that you don't have the institutional or retail support in the equity market, and therefore there's no underlying support. Uh, and I think that's really it. When you have a product like gaming, which many can relate to, uh, many can understand what's happening, the trends, then they're willing to invest in that. Mm. Really but I can only support that. I mean, it's um, individual investors, private investors, there's not many that invest in small stocks, at least, in Germany. Mm. And institutionals, there is no micro cap market anymore in Germany. That was 10 years ago, it was different. But there's hardly any fund that invests in micro caps. Uh, and the few that do is, is more speculative. Uh, so at the moment, you do a capital increase to get a bit of rebate, and they throw the shares on the market a week later to make a, a little bit of profit. So there is no really sustainable capital market for, for small companies. And then on top, the cluster idea that, uh, yeah. that in Sweden came up, which educates a cluster, or how to say, it, investors and also in the clusters yes. makes even more sense. And I think they distinguish between Remco and Lars and so on. They, they, they under, understand the underlying sector, but they distinguish between them. They learn from each other. So th they're not all bundled into one. Mm -hmm. It's really each one has a different model, different strategy, uh, but they understand the underlying concept that they're looking for growth and they want investors to back that. And we are a little bit proud that, in, that we are, let's say, as a non-Swedish company, uh, having the almost the biggest uh, private investor base in Sweden, actually. It's fantastic. And yeah. there's a big following around Remco, and, and it's... Uh, it, Fan club. <laughs> and, and, and they call them the hidden jewel, uh, because everybody's so focused on the bigger Swedish ones, uh, but uh, Remco's delivering very well. It's fantastic. All right. That's also fun to be there. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, John, you, you, let's look <laughs> at uh, the stock exchange from the point of view of the company being listed rather than the owners. Then, uh, you recently worked for, a, or you previously worked for a publicly traded company. Now you're working for a privately owned company. What are the best parts and maybe the not so best parts <laughs> of the two? Wow. Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the the aspects, and you probably have even more insight than I do from yeah. the Paradox uh, IPO, but uh, one of the things we talked about before it happened was that let's not get into this quarterly thinking. tempo and thinking because it takes a couple of years to make a, a good game and maybe even three years to make a great game. Uh, and if you need to deliver every quarter for a game, you see the equation doesn't add quite add up. Um, so you were talking about you need a portfolio strategy. Yeah. You need to make sure that the revenue is what increases, not necessarily the number of uh, releases or titles. Um, so I think, um, but you are still there. You're being scrutinized and, and people are still some people who buy your share will still expect that quarterly delivery. Uh, so Almost everybody, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> may, maybe not the, the larger investors that you have time to sit down with, explain the business, and they think it's a good idea and a good investment. Then you have a different type of dialogue than, than with everyone else. Mm. Um, but I also think we had the benefit back then of 
involving our player community. You were talking about them as yeah. potential shareholders, and that's exactly what we were thinking, that we, we knew we had a, a big fan base that uh, probably wanted to uh, have the ability to, to join the ride if they, they wanted to, and we wanted to give them that chance, which also kind of builds uh, a different type of relationship with your investors. Now, uh, raising uh, private capital is, is a different beast, uh, definitely. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, I would call that more stressful than, than being, a, being a public company. Uh, it's, it's, you definitely have the, the investors closer, breathing down your neck. And expecting they're not waiting the, a quarter. No, they're more <laughs> like uh, maybe expecting monthly reports and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, so it, it's quite different and uh, uh, different tempo, definitely. Hmm, that's it, interesting. So, so be, having private investors is actually a quicker tempo than being publicly traded. Well, in some you, ways. you get questions more often. Oh. But again, this is my individual experience. Obviously, Andras was the CFO at yeah. Paradox, so he probably have a completely different uh, No, but I think you, you're that. absolutely right. I think that we've been talking about the financing aspect here, uh, about the culture uh, in a gaming culture. How do you keep the culture of the company, which is this, the essence? I think we heard it before. How do you build the right people, the right culture? And, 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 and I think the, the, the being a listed company, if you don't do it right, can be a distraction. But uh, at the end of the day, it can also be a way to engage because I think a lot of private companies have the, the challenge of how do you reward employees? How do you attract employees with stock option programs? And of course, being a liquid company, you can create more <coughs> visible and clear and transparent option structures, which allows companies to attract employees and, and to engage them financially as well. Uh, because otherwise, it's a long story. I mean, to say, listen, in, in 10 years, we will do some sort of exit or whatever it is that you're going to be part of that journey whilst here you know you're fighting for talent on a daily basis and uh, but at the end of the day you have to stay true to your culture it's this and that's not the culture of being a listed company it's the culture of being a gaming company yeah. and, and i think that's what you have to be uh, stick to mm. So interesting. So uh, Florian, you're the token creator on this panel. <laughs> uh, and, and I've been kind of working up to this question. Uh, is it any different f in the creative process working for a publicly traded company? Does it impact or, or change your work in any way? I mean, fundamentally, I would say no. It's, we have seen when we went uh, uh, public, we've seen a, a massive growth, of course. So like uh, Toadman and H7 in uh, particular has uh, grown uh, a, in a substantial amount. However, I think that the, to, to preserve this culture, to preserve the culture and the identity of the studios, one thing that Toadman was always very particular about is to have the studios as autonomous as they can be so that studios can do what's best for them. We do. We studios can decide what tech they want to use. We try to keep the people we need to make decisions in house. That is not to say that we don't share resources. That is one of the power, the the great benefits of being part of such an uh, international company. But um, we want to preserve this kind of. Uh, in Berlin, we want to preserve the Berlin spirit. It shouldn't feel like we're part of a major company. It should feel like it is the Berlin studio working on the games that, are, that we want to do, um, enforcing the culture that we want uh, to have and to like, actively counteract um, the, the feeling of alienation that I think can come when you have the... Uh, the idea that somebody else somewhere is deciding what Berlin is now doing. Mm. And so the creative process has been remarkably stable, actually. Like, it, it's still mostly the, the, the office coming together and, and designing the game. Mm. Very interesting. And uh, let's uh, open up in a second for, for uh, questions from, from the audience, if you have them, start thinking about them. Uh, right now, but Remco, if I come to you then with mm -hmm. the same question, um, how, what do you think about autonomy versus integration? How, how do you work with the companies in your portfolio? 
Yeah, we have a bit different opinion there, uh, which is really integrating um, the companies that become part of the, um, of the group. Uh, we have two clusters, because apart from gaming, uh, we started also a media cluster. Um, advertising technology, basically, you say. Because for gaming, there's two success factors, or two main success factors. The one is content, uh, developing games, developing content, new games. And the other one is really making sure that you get players into your games, especially with the number of game launches, that's extremely important. And that's the reason that we started a bit over three years ago, ago to also start acquiring media companies. But on both sides, we like to integrate uh, because you get more efficient. It's trying to use the same technology, um, trying to, let's say, a role play game um, is similar to another role play game. So we cluster in, in game types much more than in which company did we buy and where does it come from, um, which gives a bit of friction sometimes, mostly not because people are also happy to be part of something larger and, and uh, more efficient and to have more resources altogether. But there, it's, it's just different opinions. Uh, I know that Lars is very much a believer um, in, in uh, Embracer and also Stillfront actually and, and uh, EG7 basically as well in keeping things different. Uh, we believe in integrating uh, and a bit more in efficiency in that sense. So there's room for different views uh, or flavors of that. Uh, do we have somebody in the f on the floor. Um, Adam, they, um, there's a lot of names here. You talk about uh, Embracer almost as if it's sim the same as the individual Lars Wingefors, the yeah. CEO. Is there too much of a person focus? What happens if the person wants to do something else? Well, uh, oh, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, what happens with uh, Steve? Apple's done pretty well without Steve Jobs, <laughs> but, uh, and we miss him. But uh, no, I think you have to build a strong management behind, uh, you know, the driver. And and uh, so I, I, I don't. Of course, uh, a strong leader is always a, a, an asset, but it's also a potential weakness if you can't make yourself independent of that. So. I think investors question that, uh, ask for that, uh, and uh, want to understand the management team behind it. So, and it's also too hard working if you do everything yourself. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> it's not scalable. <laughs> it's not scalable. So, so I think uh, uh, having someone is an asset that is very visible to the market. Uh, Remco, Lars, many others. But I think at the end of the day, you have to need you, you need to have a strong management team that drives the business. Mm. And uh, I don't think the market, I think the market looks beyond that as well. Um, but of course, uh, it's an asset if you can use that uh, visibility of a strong leader. Mm. All right. Uh, okay, anyone? No, because I have such smart questions, so I'm light years ahead of you. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. Um, anyone else on the, on the person cult? Uh, Johanna, then, uh, you talked about um, Sweden having such a small home market when you uh, explained the numbers. Uh, and and uh, Sweden does have, what, maybe a tenth of the number of consumers uh, compared to Germany. How, how has that influenced uh, the, the Swedish industry, having such a small domestic market? I think, I think we definitely have gone international. Uh, Directly, in a way, and I, I think that's w we share that with uh, with uh, the Finnish market, for example, and, and uh, all those successful Finnish game companies. We can't we can't cater to a to a local market. I I know you did back when you <laughs> <In the laughs> worked 90s. in the that's in the nineties when when you worked with games and and um, we saw the, uh, some kids' games back back then as well, but I think now you you have to uh, you have to look global and global directly, and and that's uh, of course a b benefit of of doing that uh, is to to reach a, a, a global market from from start, and uh, we have a yeah we have a good games are. are Digital <coughs> consumer goods. We, we don't really have that. In, uh, it's it's quite unique as a market, uh, because uh, even other media markets or other um, uh, technology, they they usually like start somewhere and and do that, and and uh, they either solve problems or they uh, um, their main business idea is to. Um, uh, 
uh, like movies, they, they don't s sell to to the audience first. They sell to to theaters or um, TV channels, but but games are usually like to the consumer right away, and and that's that's also unique. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It did you have a question, Felix? Yes. So I'll let John comment. <laughs> and in the meantime, I will listen to your answer. I will walk with <laughs> the mic. John. All right. No, I'm just going to continue on what uh, Johanna said that <coughs> and, and what you said, Per, uh, that games is about love, right? Yes. Uh, and I think part of it is also about bringing people closer in interactive, uh, in interactive games. You can talk to friends across the globe, and that's how you keep, keep your friends uh, closer and so I think uh, Sweden has always been a bit of a traveling people and meeting people all over the place so it's just a natural thing to also aim at a at global market from the start. Yeah and, and we also we need to make games in, in English uh, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> there isn't enough people who would understand <laughs> anything else. And uh, and that's even if it's not our our native language. I think th the fact that we still have to use it that's that's probably one of the one of the reasons behind it uh, too. Because I I also think that that might be a downside for for American or uh, British companies. There are of course they're looking they they're releasing everything in English, but they only see their home market uh, as the audience because. They think that uh, everyone is, is like them because they speak the same language, and that's probably also something. Are, are you bragging that we are so humble? <laughs> 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 I have <Yes>. Felix Falk. <laughs> um, thank you for a very uh, interesting discussion. Um, I wondered, um, I mean, you, you um, already said that the situation for investment in games within Germany is quite weak um, up right now. Um, so um, what is, um, from your opinion, what are the easiest ways to change this situation? What should we or um, government or a games industry or any other actors um, do to change that situation within Germany to get a stronger um, investment market? I mean, if, I, my, my point of view is that uh, one of the challenges is that if you look at our rules that we have as an exchange, they're no different from scale uh, and the Deutsche Börse's rules and so on. So I think that the problem is what you meet behind those rules. And what you meet behind those rules in Sweden is a very engaged equity market that is willing to invest in smaller growth companies that are scalable in which they can relate to. And I think that's the definition of the sector. A lot of uh, investors can, can relate to that. I mean, I've been to Gamescom. I've never seen so many people at once. In Sweden, they really see that as an opportunity not only to play the games, but also to invest. I think to create an equity culture is not a threat. It's an opportunity. But it has to be managed well. And I think that's the underlying aspect. Uh, I think then, for this particular sector, maybe there is an education aspect. Uh, education in terms of the, the opportunity, the, you know, the, the, what, what, you know, now with 5G and uh, all these different dimensions that are coming, you know, what is the opportunity in terms of scalability of the sector and, and the potential you have, you're highlighting the success that you have within the sector in, in, in Germany? I don't know, but I think the underlying factor is that we could not export Nasdaq First North here and start opening up Nasdaq First North because then I would need to deal with the same problem Deutsche Börse has here with the underlying market that doesn't exist. Uh, so, so what I do is I tell German companies stay German but come to the Swedish market and, and, and use the capital market there because they understand you and want to invest in you. So it's not about you know, becoming a Swedish company, it's about staying active in your market by leveraging the, the financing market. And, that's that's uh, unfortunately I think that those are the two things educate and then uh, allow for the equity market to be much broader and it used to be like that I mean it's just that the German market uh, since Neumark everybody's so afraid of retail should not own shares and and uh, this is a risk but risk is also an opportunity if managed well why can make it tax deductible yeah, make a definitely. tax advantage. So uh, it's a structural. I mean, yeah, my yeah. feeling also, it's a structural issue that there is, 
and to overcome it will either take years of education, if it works at all, or you go there with more financial, uh, let's say, advantages and just um, stimulate um, investments in, in microcaps. And can also be non-public. I mean, also non-public, there is in Germany, there's a lot of seed money, but there's no growth money, or hardly yeah. any growth money. I agree. I think, I think one, one, one thing I think we can point to in, in, uh, in the case of Sweden is that it was when, when we saw people from the industry starting to work on the investment side that, it actually, that we actually took a leap. Uh, of course, we have talked a lot about Embracer and Lars Wingefors, but when he, he really started to growing THQ that became Embracer, that's, I think that was really a game changer in, in a way. And at the same time, we saw uh, Martin Wallfisch, the founder of Massive, started working at uh, the Nordisk Film Inv Investment Fund. And when, so when people from the industry starting to look into investment, I think it's also easier for, for like the traditional um, uh, funds or financial people to, to like start looking into and see what are they doing and then you can catch back and, and do the same. So w when you have people from the industry investing, look at what they do and then it's... But I, I, also, I also think that Sweden is a much quicker embracer of technology than many other markets. Uh, and I think, you know, we have fiber in our winter cottages, uh, that's a, a human right. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, when the iGaming space came, which took on much quicker than the digital, you know, when the social gaming, um, it was largely driven by the great, you know, the fact, uh, the opportunity of the iPhone. And, and I think that spilled over to the gaming sector. And I think the investors saw, wait, where, where is this platform gonna go? Where is it gonna bring us? Uh, and I think that's what really fueled a lot of the uh, of the growth. Uh, mm. And uh, but there's so many different components that bring it together uh, and that make it a success. And, 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 and it can still be improved. So, and maybe also a topic for further investigation because uh, investors sometimes think of games as technology, whereas games industry typically says, no, no, we're not technology. We're different. We're entertainment or yes. something in between. So what will happen now is I will take three questions. And then we'll just do a closing round because we're out of time. So we'll do the three questions in a row. You will not get the feedback. You will just say your question and then you will get your feedback later. Okay? <laughs> That's how we work. Pim and then here and then Malte. Pim. Okay. I guess I have to make this one count then. Uh, I'm totally unqualified to ask this question. But so I understand, uh, Remco, the, the, the benefits of having the cluster. But uh, looking right now, uh, what the trend is on, 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 on the stock market, uh, or at least what I've been uh, observing, and as I said, not qualified, uh, can it be a dual-edged so sword? Because it's been pretty much on a hype for the previous years, and kind of, I'm pretty sure it's kind of the hype served you well. Uh, but if, let's say, uh, one of the major uh, listed companies start like uh, half their valuation in, in like a year, isn't there a risk that it actually drags you down in, 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 in the fall as well? Right, so wait, yep. hold that thought. Thank you very yep. much, Pim. All right, and then we have... Uh, yes, uh, so one question we were talking about a lot about uh, scaling and uh, new opportunities. So how do you see on like, or what can the game industry bring into other industries? I mean, we're already seeing like a gamification of, of the educational sector. And I think there's so much that other industries can learn from, from the gaming industry. And uh, what do you see? Well, like, where are the largest opportunities for, for the gaming sector or industry to, to, um, yeah, to enter new industries, basically? All right, great. And Henrik, I will ask you to do your little acrobat uh, thing and uh, we'll pass the mic down here. And Malta, you will have the last question. Make it count, yeah, like I said. I think that, that one of the questions is the absence of this market to distribution of uh, investment in the German market, that was uh, Felix's question. And I would uh, just contribute that I think that if you want to go uh, and invest in a gaming company, for example, in Germany, and you go to your banker and say, please find me a company in Germany, I would like to invest in a gaming company, they will say that doesn't exist. We, we mm -hmm. cannot do it. 
We, there's not, you can invest in Embracer if you want, but uh, there's no German company you could invest. Well, I have there is Rancor, but yeah, uh, I think I think I think I think that is that is that is the point. Yeah, the point yeah. is that uh, the, the the banks in Germany and the the, 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 the the advisors of investors in Germany are not ready to um, to support this kind of thinking. Mm. Good, thank you. Okay, so I, I will call that visibility. Uh, or maybe education, uh, visible education. So we have, um, we have the cluster effect. Can it be a double-edged sword, bring you down uh, if, if not on your own account, but maybe because mistakes of others? And then we have new opportunities, other sectors, maybe selling services, technology to other sectors. And then we have this topic that we've touched upon a few times about uh, educating the wider ecosystem of investors and I guess analysts and auditors and things like that. So uh, I will give everybody a chance to give a last comment and then we will see if we have been able to explain how come Sweden is the biggest investor in the German games industry. Remco, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll start with a double-edged sword. Uh, you're correct, that's, that's a fact. Uh, you see at the moment that, uh, let's say, a lot of investors are correcting their portfolios with, with uh, the percentage of uh, gaming stock that they have in it in Sweden. And that, uh, let's say, all game companies are hurt by that. The ones that are a bit underperforming a bit more than the others. But also companies that are doing well are, let's say, by this kind of corrections uh, a bit. But it has also to do that there was so much euphoria, I would say, during COVID and, and the game company couldn't do anything wrong. And as we all know, that investors are also kind of herds uh, that are running behind each other. Now uh, it's very difficult to do something right as a gaming company after COVID. Uh, so there's a very short memory of investors. And, uh, but let's say from our experience, when we, st when we did the listing in Sweden, we immediately doubled our uh, market cap. Um, so then you can even have some corrections. So I'd rather have the double-edged sword and have an environment um, where people understand it and where the valuations by that are also higher. Um, yeah, it comes with it. Okay, good. Thank you. Florian, have we managed to explain the I'd mystery? I'd I don't think Frank, from the from the view of a uh, of, uh, creator working on games, I think um, this Swedish model that, uh, I want to call it like, that uh, uh, EG7 also um, runs is very powerful for uh, studios like us, where we can set up in markets that aren't overpopulated and we're able to grow in those markets with solid support. Good. And I think Germany is one of those places currently. Great promise. All right, Jan, do you want to pick uh, that one or <laughs> um, any of the other? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll continue on the double-edged sword because I, I mean, I agree with everything you said, uh, but, but I also think it's, uh, important to point out that we um, even if there are corrections or even if one of the companies fail and that kind of temporarily gives the industry a bad reputation or something I think overall that is also a learning like in any other industry and and if that learning um, if it's the investors that learn something or if it's the industry itself and the people within it that learn something and then iterate and, and create something even better. Um, I think that double-edged sword isn't so double-edged. It's, uh, it's really just a, a hive mind within an industry that try will constantly keep improving like any other industry for that matter. Mm. You sound almost like a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist yeah, on maybe. capital. That's great. <laughs> I love it. I'll <laughs> come back as a junior coder in my next <laughs> Well done. No, I mean, first of all, uh, it's, it's not the market, it's the entrepreneurs. So, uh, but if there's no market, then we can't support the entrepreneurs. So I think from that perspective, uh, I think one of the key trends that this market really will go, there has been a euphoria, uh, and, uh, but there's still substance. Uh, but I think the substance has to adapt and, and to mature correctly. And I think ESG is not something that will not touch the sector uh, and, and it has to grow responsibly. If it does so, the world is, is, it oyster, is its oyster because I think you know, this sector is just going to grow, the platform is going to be stronger, you have 5G coming out, you have platforms that are just becoming more and more tangible. 
Uh, and uh, so I think people will want to invest in that and, and to the point uh, in terms of investing it, it's very difficult for a in private individual to invest in a private company, but it's, it's more easy to invest in a public company, therefore the demand. Uh, and, uh, and investors are definitely looking to support that growth. And in terms of how it's spreading, definitely the education sector from my point of view, what do I see? But I see also the financial markets learning a lot from the gaming sector, how to visualize things, how to you know, make things easier to understand uh, and more graphical. Uh, so I, I think uh, the gaming sector will be uh, a role model for many, many uh, sectors. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, uh, fixing what the Germany does not have in terms of a capital market for SME growth market, growth companies in the public market, that's not a quick fix. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but we're more than open to discuss with German companies that want to embrace what Remco has done, but uh, the best person to speak to is Remco. He's done it, <laughs> not me. All right, great. Thanks, Adam. Johanna, have we been able to come up with uh, an answer? <laughs> yes, no, but I, I think w I, I, of course, agree with a lot of what have already been said. I think what we can see, of course, the financial market need to learn and, and everyone in it needs to learn how I think game companies need to learn the financial market better and, and the financial market stakeholder need to learn the games industry better. But if we look at the companies we actually have in the industry, we have a clear view on on um, on how the trend ha has been, and that's what we've been writing in this report. And uh, we don't see the ups and downs in the same way when it, when we look at the whole whole industry. And I think that's the more company that has that are on the exchanges, and and the more companies we will see in the future. And it, it's not just individual companies anymore. And I think. Uh, Eventually, we will learn that that the individual companies can can behave badly, can have a bad year, can have a bad release, can go bankrupt, but that's not the industry itself. And of course, the industry are affecting other industries too. We can see that with employees um, shifting industry, and we can see that uh, game design and game development is an attractive skill in, in different industries. But what we have in games is, is something that we create that entertains people and are fun. And if that's useful, that's good, but that's not the main reason we do games. It's, it's the love we talked about <laughs> earlier and, and the fun in it. And I think that's also very important to, uh, to know that w we don't solve problems. We, uh, we, um, we, are f uh, we are for the soul instead. I love it. All right. Big hand for the panel. They did a fantastic <laughs> job. How come Sweden is the biggest investor? It's because of fun and because of love. Thank you very much for coming <laughs> on the panel. Uh, and before you go, we have one more for you, and it's a special, special treat, because uh, we've talked about games all day, uh, but now it's time to actually play a game. So um, it's, uh, it's about time that we get our hands on a game. And we have for you uh, nothing less than a world premiere, and with me to uh, what's what's that word to to blow the cover or or to release it or to that smash sounds about the right. champagne <laughs> on the ship <laughs> is none other than Tobi Bengtsson of Mag Interactive. Mag Interactive, as we heard, is another publicly traded. That's Swedish right. That's company. right. Very very nice beer. It's fun to be at a physical event again. Finally. Welcome. Um, so thank glad you. to have thank you. you. So uh, so yeah, uh, Mag is a mobile, Swedish mobile games company, and in our portfolio of games, we have a game you might know. Uh, it's called Quiz Duel, or in Swedish called Quiz Campen. Yes. Maybe you've played that or you've heard about that. So, um, and today we're releasing. This is why I'm here. Super excited. Um, we're releasing the special video game quiz, which we have created together with the Swedish Embassy here in Berlin. And also you, Per, maybe if you knew what you were reading, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not so much, but yeah. I, I think I gave you feedback on one question. 
<laughs> so I, I think I, that counts as a collaboration. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. And right. so our, our Quistle team has created this. Um, so uh, how to play? You download new Quistle or Neues Quistle in, in German or uh, Nia Quizkampen, basically. But it, you don't have to play it now. You can play you with uh, when you're having in your cocktails. In the networking session. Uh, and, and also, this is a great networking opportunity because if you're, if you're not a, a German speaker, you, 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 you know, put yourself close to a German speaker and help the, um, get their help. So that way we make the German-Swedish connection. See how this works? Exactly. It sort of comes through <laughs> every part of this event. Because the, the quiz is in German, so you will only find it in the German version of the game. So if you have uh, Quistel in Swedish installed, you can just log out and create uh, a new account so you can play the German version. But my head is spinning. Have you made a game about games? This is how it looks, exactly. All right. Gaming quiz. Gaming quiz. And so we have yeah. this is a game about games. It's, it's yeah, no, it's super like, meta. Yeah. It's, it's actually not been uh, done in this way in Crystal before, and this this game has uh, existed in. It's almost ten years old now, but uh, I think I believe we did a retro quiz last year, but not. This is kind of more contemporary. People in here, you should you should be able to nail this. Um, yeah. And and Pat can translate for you. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, I, and and uh, but don't hold me accountable to to your results because I don't know what you know, <laughs> um, and that's the beauty of quiz, um, and and quiz duel is really successful in in Germany. I yeah, mean it's it's our biggest market. So it's and I think uh, what I've known since I worked at Mag is that uh, it, it seems like people don't really know it's a Swedish game, so that's also interesting. And tomorrow. You'll hear more about Quistel because our Quistel specialist, Per Hedelund, will talk about the design of Quistel. But uh, yeah, so, so please play and uh, tell me how you did. And we uh, will be playing <laughs> against all, because I. All, all the players in Germany. It's quiz like, duel. It's a quiz and it's also a duel. Yeah, like the, the, the usual games you play, like uh, Felix Falk, I believe, plays against his mother. Then it's like a duel. I play yeah. against you and you have six rounds. But here you will play solo versus the whole of the German play base, basically. Wow. So You will I mean, be playing against millions of Germans. They're very astute. I mean, they're really good. So if, if you get 10 out of eight, uh, 18 out of 18 questions right, Per will buy you a drink. Yeah, right. If you can find me, <laughs> <laughs> he'll hide behind the bar. Uh, that, yeah. That's great, and and it's a, it's a it's a really cool case. How how come a game that was thought of thought up by a teacher in Sweden all those years ago became Germany's most popular game during a period? And and we'll hear more about that tomorrow. And we'll be back uh, tomorrow in this room at 9.30. And then there we'll talk about Quiz Duel. We'll talk about the games, some of the games in the exhibition, and also some other perspectives on, on game creation. So please come back tomorrow.